Good morning. This is Jay Baker. I'm the moderator for the session. And um, we're going to talk about some recent research and hurricane evacuation behavior. I have just heard that uh, someone in the audience couldn't hear me. Testing. Testing one, two. OK, it's there now. Um, let me repeat that just in case some other people didn't didn't get it. Um, I'm Jay Baker. I'm going to be moderating this session. We're going to be having some presentations about um, evacuation behavior in some recent hurricanes. Um, we have three excellent panelists that uh, have done a great deal of this kind of work. And, um, I, you know, this is a topic that everyone's sort of interested in. We all form impressions about what people did in hurricanes and why, but a lot of that is anecdotal. And so these people have collected data more systematically and with the purpose of being able to generalize more than we can from the sort of an anecdotal impressions that we get. So um, we're gonna have Mike Lindell we're to talk a bit about Hurricane Harvey. We're gonna have Laura Myers talk about Hurricane Michael, and we're gonna have Amy Poland talk about Hurricane Irma. Um, I'm not real big on introductions in terms of giving you a lot of information. Um, take my word for it, they all have excellent credentials. <laughs> uh, so we're gonna start with Mike Lindell. Uh, Mike is, uh, had to get up early for this. He's out in Seattle. Um, and Mike has a number of affiliations with uh, research affiliations with universities. But um, I usually introduce him as being a professor emeritus from Texas A&M, uh, where he did most of his hurricane work. So, Mike, what I'm going to do is just uh, switch to you now and make you the panelist. I mean, uh, yeah, the panelist and see what happens. OK. OK. Now, um, let's see, let me. OK, uh, I'm going to be, as Jay said, I'm going to be talking about uh, the Hurricane Harvey evacuation. It was a project uh, that uh, David Beerling and Walt Peacock and uh, Alex Abuhara and I did. I want to begin by uh, talking about uh, what it is that I'm going to focus on in, in this presentation. Uh, it was a very lengthy questionnaire addressed a lot of topics, uh, some of which were topics that uh, have received a fair amount of attention, uh, for example, uh, predicting uh, who does and who doesn't evacuate. But what I'm going to focus on here today are some uh, neglected uh, topics in, in the research literature. First one is uh, uh, pre-impact information. Uh, what kind of information channels have uh, people used uh, during Hurricane Harvey, what kind of graphics did they see? Uh, what kind of evacuation preparations did they make? What kind of local trips did they take uh, before evacuation? Uh, how did they uh, plan their travel routes and accommodations? Uh, what were their uh, decision and departure times uh, uh, with evacuation travel? Uh, how many household groups uh, left uh, separately? Uh, what evacuation routes did they take and uh, did they make any changes and how did they decide to uh, change their evacuation routes? And then finally, uh, their destinations and accommodations. Okay, so starting first with the uh, frequency of consulting uh, different hazard information channels, uh, this is a question that we asked again uh, that uh, we hadn't asked since our survey of uh, Hurricane Lily, and uh, let's see, let me drag that out of the way. Uh, what we can see here is that the uh, let's see. Oh, uh, there we go. The uh, major focus was on uh, local news and national uh, news, and that is something. That's a continuation from what we've seen before. Uh, what was interesting in comparison to Hurricane Lily is that the internet was used uh, a lot more in Hurricane Harvey uh, than in Lily. 
And then, of course, uh, social media got a fair amount of attention. Uh, obviously, that question wasn't asked during Hurricane Lily because social media didn't exist then. One of the things you'll notice is local authorities um, are down near the bottom, and that's because people don't usually get information directly from local authorities. Uh, they get it uh, through intermediates, such as the uh, local, especially the um, local radio and uh, television. Their evacuation queues are uh, primarily official evacuation warnings. Again, this uh, repeats something in the literature. Uh, the NHC uh, watches and warnings are another major cue. Uh, but uh, one of the things that uh, has, has shown up uh, repeatedly is that there are social cues for evacuation when they see other uh, people in their neighborhood evacuating or they're talking to people uh, on the phone uh, that uh, have said that they're going to evacuate. And of course, uh, businesses uh, closing is another cue. On the hurricane graphics, uh, one of the, that's been an issue of um, really uh, intense research. Well, uh, some research, uh, intense research kind of overstates it, uh, but uh, there's been a number of laboratory experiments over the past uh, 15 years about uh, hurricane graphics and their effects. Uh, the uh, forecast track, as you can see, is, is uh, the uh, graphic that is most commonly seen uh, wind swath and uh, ensemble forecasts, are, uh, or the ensemble forecasts known as spaghetti plots, are also pretty common. And then uncertainty cone plus forecast track or uncertainty cone only are uh, the uh, least common. For the local of, uh, number of local trips before evacuation departure, what you can see here is that the most common is none. Uh, the overwhelming majority of people took no local trips. Uh, they uh, just uh, evacuated directly. Now that doesn't preclude the possibility, given the way the question was asked, that people uh, uh, might have stopped, uh, say, to get gas, to get money, to get something else on their way out of town. but. Uh, all, uh, the majority of people did not take special trips within town uh, that contributed to uh, local travel uh, before they uh, departed. What you can see here for the, the trip purpose is pretty evenly distributed across a number of different activities, buying gas, getting money, buying water, uh, and uh, buying food are particularly common. But there are other things like buying medicine, picking up riders as well. The evacuation rates are uh, uh, not terribly surprising. What you can see here, the, uh, the figures that are uh, outlined in red are the coastal uh, counties, San Patricio, Aransas, Calhoun, Matagorda. Uh, so they were uh, the coastal counties and they were immediately to the right and left of the uh, uh, point of uh, landfall. Uh, the lower evacuation rates, you can see for uh, the other counties, uh, three of them were inland and then Nueces County uh, to the far left bottom is a coastal county, but it was pretty substantially to the left of the um, hurricane uh, landfall. The evacuation timing, uh, I mentioned this not because it's new, but because it, uh, it once again reinforces uh, the uh, pattern that we've seen in uh, so many hurricanes uh, that uh, the dominant time of evacuation is uh, late morning and early afternoon, and that you can see that this increases uh, over time, there are there's a fair n number of people who uh, evacuate as many as three or four days before landfall, but the evacuation rates increase steadily as you get closer to landfall, especially when you get the hurricane watch and warning. 
And then instead of being equally distributed between morning and afternoon departures, there's a shift toward morning departures because people are expecting uh, probably that it's going to take longer to get to where they want to go. And so they want to be there before nightfall. And uh, so uh, morning departure is the best time to ensure that that happens. The arrangements for fr prior accommodations, for those that did not make any prior accommodations uh, before leaving, uh, it's pretty equally distributed uh, between peers, that is staying with friends or relatives, uh, staying in commercial facilities or uh, staying in other uh, facilities. Uh, these are second homes. Uh, they might have an RV and they're staying uh, in an RV camp. Uh, those who did uh, contact before uh, primarily stayed with peers. Those who made their reservations en route primarily stayed in commercial facilities and uh, to no great surprise, uh, there a very small proportion of people stayed in public shelters. Evacuation modes, what you can see is that first, uh, the overwhelming majority left in uh, a single group, although some people left in two separate groups, that is groups departing at, at different times, uh, two groups, three groups, or in, in some cases, four or more groups from a single household. Number of vehicles was overwhelmingly uh, uh, one vehicle per household, uh, although uh, roughly a third, little less than a third uh, had two and uh, about uh, almost 10% had uh, three or more vehicles. Uh, the, uh, you can see here that uh, only a small minority of people rode with somebody else or used public transit or, or other. Uh, the reason for the route choice, 90%, uh, just over 90% uh, uh, chose a route before they left and they stuck with that route. Uh, three quarters of those picked it because it was a familiar route. Uh, and uh, this, again, is something that we've seen a number of, of times before and uh, is potentially a problem or actually has been a problem in a number of evacuations when the most familiar route uh, gets overloaded uh, and there are other routes that are less familiar that get uh, substantially underloaded. Only a, a little less than 10% changed their routes, and uh, most of them uh, did so uh, because of the conditions that they observed en route, rather than uh, phone reports, radio reports, official directions, or, or other uh, sources of information. Uh, the median distance for uh, uh, evacuations uh, was 133 miles. Uh, as you can see in the center of uh, the, the figure there, that uh, there is a, uh, a swath of uh, destinations starting at about uh, San Antonio, going through New Braunfels, uh, up through Austin, and as far as Waco, uh, right uh, along the, uh, the front of the, the hill country. Uh, that's uh, a pretty typical pattern for, uh, for evacuations from the coastal bend area. Uh, San Antonio and Austin are, are, are popular destinations uh, regardless of where a hurricane makes a landfall uh, for a variety of reasons. One is that they've got a lot of commercial facilities and uh, as long as people are gonna be taking an unscheduled vacation, uh, those are some of the places that they like to go. Okay, so uh, future research uh, should uh, examine a number of issues. First, changes over time in evacuees' reliance on different hazard information sources and, and channels. As I mentioned before, uh, uh, the first question that we asked or the first question that I talked about uh, was something that we asked uh, in the Hurricane Lily evacuation. And so looking to see how uh, Technology changes the patterns of people's uh, information seeking is something that needs to be done. And uh, 
in particular uh, tracking the reliance on the internet and also for social media. Uh, also, we want to look at uh, variations across storms and need for more uh, rapid warning dissemination distributions. Uh, one uh, issue is a storm with late intensification, uh, which would require uh, evacuations from areas farther inland from the previous evacuation zone, and a storm with late changing track. Uh, Charlie in 2004, uh, Brett in, two, in 1999, uh, both uh, require rapid warning of households in areas that were previously thought to be safe. And that's particularly true when you get a very sharp uh, change in hurricane track, uh, as was the case, uh, for example, with Hurricane Brett, where it was a 90 degree change in, in track that uh, fortunately took place um, just north of Brownsville and just south of Corpus Christi. So the storm made landfall in Kennedy County that had a population of about 500. So there wasn't much of a problem there. Uh, future research should also examine the types and timing of evacuation preparation activities, which can be important in cases when there's a, 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 a late change in hurricane behavior. And also the interrelationship between warning dissemination and evacuation preparation needs to, uh, further examination. Because the standard formulation, which is that the uh, evacuation time estimate is a function of authorities' decision time, uh, warning dissemination time, household preparation time, and evacuation travel time, assumes that these uh, components are statistically independent. And uh, there are cases, especially with hurricanes, when there is uh, ample forewarning that people may be uh, engaging in some preparation times before they actually receive a warning. And so therefore the uh, uh, warning time, the warning dis or the, sorry, the uh, household evacuation preparation time can appear to be zero because the preparation was done before the warning was received. That's very different from the kind of situation uh, that I've been uh, doing research on recently, which is tsunami evacuation uh, where the uh, uh, the authorities decision time is followed by warnings which is followed by household preparation which is followed by uh, evacuation departure so different kinds of hazards are going to lead to different patterns here and further research needs to be done to sort that out and then finally predictors of uh, uh, departure timing route choices and uh, destinations and accommodations, because there really isn't that much research on that that has been published in uh, the literature. So that takes care of uh, my presentation, uh, and I want to uh, thank uh, my uh, co-investigators and also the uh, uh, National Science Foundation, which got this rolling with some uh, a very small amount of funding, and then also the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers that supplied the bulk of the funding for the project. Thank you, Mike. Um, I neglected earlier to tell the audience that uh, they could submit questions, and I uh, didn't see any. Um, I, I didn't see anything that dealt specifically with what you had said. Uh, let me just ask a of one or two things myself. One is uh, you, you said there were 15% of the people left in more than one group, but 38% left in more than one vehicle. Does that imply to you that that uh, the difference accounts for people who were sort of trying to evacuate in tandem? That is, two cars, but one right after the other and calling it one group? Right, right. Yeah, it's, um, uh, there's, uh, uh, a number of, of researchers that have speculated that um, this happens frequently simply because uh, cars are a portable form of wealth. Uh, they can't move their homes, uh, so they load up their cars and, and take as, uh, as many cars um, as they can that are uh, functional. 
uh, although that in some cases is limited by the number of, of licensed drivers. Uh, they may have more cars than they have licensed drivers in the household. <laughs> but in, in most cases, it, 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 the suspicion is that uh, uh, if they're concerned that, they, uh, that there's going to be damaging uh, winds or surge, that they just want to get the, uh, the cars out and uh, protect them. Good. Well, listen, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, we may get some questions su submitted during the other presentations, and so we may come back to you later okay. on. Okay. Laura, I think that we have you on the screen now. Um, Laura is at the University of Alabama, and um, she's uh, with the, what is the Center for Public Safety Research, is that right? Yes, Center for Advanced Public Safety. Okay, and um, she's going to talk about Hurricane Michael. This is one that's going to be especially interesting to me because the very first hurricane whose uh, evacuation I ever studied was in Panama City, Florida. It was uh, for Hurricane Eloise back in 1975. So a lot, a lot of things have changed in Panama City since then. And um, so I'm eager to hear about what happened in Hurricane Michael. So Laura. Thank you, Jay. All right, uh, as Jay said, I'm Laura Myers from the University of Alabama and I'm a social scientist and I work with the Weather Enterprise to assess a variety of weather events and in this particular case, we collaborated with the National Weather Service Office in Tallahassee about Hurricane Michael and uh, everything that happened with that particular event. And so I want to tell you a little bit about how we do our study and what we found out. So in regards to studying evacuation, we were very concerned with how people evacuated and how they responded to such a catastrophic, catastrophic event. And the factors that were at play in this particular event were previous experience with evacuations, which influenced their decision, their perceptions about hurricanes, which influenced their decisions. They were very uh, focused on location and timing, which we have found in all of our assessments of all different types of weather events. We studied the justifications and reasons they had for what they did and why they did it. And then we evaluated their understanding of risk, which is a whole psychological aspect of doing this kind of research. And as I mentioned, uh, we do this kind of work on, on a regular basis, and we really focus on what we call weather impact psychology. We look at what makes people take action, what shapes their perceptions, how do we get people to do what they need to do, and how do we message to capture attention. So in this particular event, we went in and did an on the ground study where we interviewed the weather enterprise and we interviewed members of the public in Panama City, Mexico Beach, uh, all the way down range of this storm. And then we went inland to Mariana, Florida and other places that took ex excessive wind damage far inland. And so we talked to them, um, interviewed them in their locations, and then we did a public survey to get their perceptions about what happened for them in this particular event. So the first point is their experience with tropical events. I mentioned that experience with um, hurricanes has a lot to do with what they do. And so 87% of our respondents, which was over 1,500 respondents, had been in a tropical storm or hurricane previously. We asked them what the primary products were that they used um, in evaluating what they should do. And they talked about the cone of uncertainty and the spaghetti plots. And of course, the cone of uncertainty usually rises to the top. And this factors in because of how people interpret the cone of uncertainty. As I mentioned, people are looking for location and timing. And the psychological justification here is, can I put myself outside the range of danger? And that means that I'm safe where I'm at. And so they will interpret this according to how they think it best suits their needs. And that gets into their whole assessment of risk. If they can determine, if they can justify to themselves they're not at risk, they may not evacuate. 
We asked them if they evacuated for this particular storm and only 38% did. And we knew that going in, we knew that very few had evacuated. And so our goal was to find out why those uh, who evacuated did and why those who didn't did not. So we started by looking at the hurricane messaging and the information that they had. And that's what we typically do in all of our weather event assessments is look at the messaging and then see how the public responded to that particular messaging. We were especially focused on the Saffir Simpson scale um, in terms of the public's perception of that, in terms of the strength of the wind. 97% were familiar with the Saffir Simpson and 69% found it helpful in their decision making. We asked them if they knew what it meant and for most they understood that it meant storm intensity and storm surge. Respondents used the scale to determine their evacuation plan in one way or the other. And so we were really interested in that breakdown because with some evacuating and not others, how did they use the Saffir Simpson to make their decisions? We asked them how important was the storms category on the Saffir Simpson when they made their decision to evacuate or stay. Uh, for 18%, it was the most important factor. For 29%, it was a factor, but not the most important. And for 45%, it was a major factor. So notice they're focusing on when in this particular event. So when you start to drill down into what all of that means, um, it was really interesting to interview people and then also look at the data from the survey to look at their perceptions about why they made the decisions they did. So for a lot of people, it was their experience with prior Gulf Coast storms. For many people, it was a matter of typically they weaken or they change direction or both. And so we do a lot of preparation and then we end up not having to have done all of that. And many of them were doing that. This was a short fuse event. There wasn't a lot of time to get ready for this sort of thing. And so many of them in their minds were saying, well, it's gonna be like it usually is. It probably won't get here and it probably won't be that bad if it does. Their experience with evacuations previous to Hurricane Michael also factored in. Many had evacuated for other storms and many referenced uh, Hurricane Opal in the 90s as a storm they had evacuated for, they didn't need to evacuate and then they couldn't get back and they weren't gonna put themselves in that position again. Many of them also said it can't possibly be that bad because hurricanes don't happen in October. And so many of them thought, well, it's probably not gonna be anything. And even if it does happen, it can't be that strong. Others used their psychology to justify that it wouldn't happen to them or they could handle it if it did. Many of them, in fact, most of them said they thought they would have time to react if it became more serious. And then others said, well, even if it happens, it's probably not gonna happen right here. A big factor in all of this was their problems imagining how big this storm could possibly be. We asked them how, if they were surprised at how large the hurricane was, and over half felt like it was a big surprise. And that's an issue in a lot of the events that we assess is we're talking about catastrophic event, events that people may never have thought about or imagined possibly happening, and they have no experience with such a catastrophic event. So it's really hard to get it in their mindset about what they're supposed to do about it. You can see here a picture of the eye wall of um, Hurricane Michael and get an idea of the, the size of the storm. And it was just something that the people in that region had no experience with. So it really comes down to their past experience about Gulf storms slowing down and weakening. Uh, direct quotes where storms usually change direction. If it's a Cat 1 or Cat 2 storm, we can handle it. And that's a pretty interesting factor here because one of the reasons we do this research is to provide this back to the weather enterprise so they can understand who they are messaging to. And so if people are not afraid of a category one or a category two, that's an issue. And then they said that when it goes to a category three, we'll evacuate. Well, that's a problem because they're probably not gonna have time to evacuate. And that's exactly what happened in this case. It went from a cat three to a four to a five so quickly, they couldn't get out. And so because it changed so fast, many of them had to stay in place and weather a catastrophic event. 
So we asked them specifically what wind speed would get them to evacuate. As you can see here, this reinforces that statement that the ones and the twos don't bother them. It's only when it gets to a category three that it starts to affect their decision making, and then especially a four and a five. Also, the graphics and the imagery that are presented in the messaging have, have an influence on their decision making. And so we wanted to you know, understand how important that was to their decision making. And the radar imagery seems to be a factor in just about every weather event, including Hurricane Michael. If you can show the scope and size, if you can show graphically something about the power, the strength, location, and timing, it makes a big difference for people. We also talked to people in vulnerable locations about what they knew, what information they had, and what influenced their decisions to evacuate. And for the most part, a lot of people in vulnerable locations were able to get out. Others did not get out because of the various challenges uh, that most people face in terms of mobility, transportation, resources. Many of them told us that if they left, they were afraid they would lose their job, uh, many of them had medical situations that they thought would be a factor if they tried to evacuate. And so there were a lot of reasons that people didn't, but for those who could, they got the messaging and they did evacuate. So we asked a double question here. We asked them about what factors influenced their decision to shelter as well as what it, um, affected their decision to evacuate. And we used all the same characteristics. And so those are paired up in this slide. So you can see from top to bottom, the top one being uh, the most influential factor. And then you can see the color cross comparison. So for those who decided to shelter in place, previous experience with hurricanes was the highest. It was a little bit lower on those who decided to evacuate. So you can see it was very similar. Uh, the forecast and the cone were important. The wind speed probability graphics were important. Storm intensity was important. So if all of these things were important and, and kind of close together with each other, why did some choose to evacuate and not others? And so that's what we wanted to drill into. A big issue was the issue of sheltering if they tried to evacuate it. Uh, many of them were concerned about shelter information and locations of shelters, uh, the similar things that we found in previous events, people trying to get their pets out and sheltering where their pets was a problem. Many of them said they didn't have enough information soon enough to evacuate and get to a shelter. And so they stayed in place because they didn't feel like they knew where to go or how to get there or what would be available to them when they got there. They also acknowledged that they thought there were limited shelter locations. And when we talked to the weather enterprise in the various counties along evacuation routes, that was a factor. Many of uh, the emergency managers told us that they didn't have many locations for people to shelter and that many people got to their counties and there was no place for them to go and they couldn't go any further. And so they ended up parked in parking lots and in open fields with no shelter, no support, which really put a lot of stress on those counties to protect those folks. And then others told us that they did have a lot of information from previous experience about sheltering and evacuating. And so they used that information to make their decisions and they went. And I think that's important to remember is that many people do evacuate. Many people um, have the information they need and do it. It's the challenges and barriers that people face and the psychological justifications that get in the way for others. So really getting down to those reasons, um, I mentioned earlier experience with Hurricane Opal's evacuation influenced a lot of people to stay. And so they stayed in this particular event and when we asked them about it, they said they would never stay again. And so I think that's a really important factor is getting people to understand that a lot of people hold these perceptions in their mind and they're gonna be really hard to move out. And so how do we get people to understand this is going to be a different event, this is serious and severe, and we need to do away with our previous perceptions. That's a hard nut to crack. You know, many people said that they, you know, resisted because they felt like they wouldn't be able to get back. Um, many people talked about, you know, they'd lose their job if they couldn't get back. They'd been told that by their employers. Many people felt like that if they left, it would turn out they didn't need to, so they weren't going to go to that trouble. And as I mentioned, they all said that uh, if they would have time, if it got more serious. And others talked about needing to protect their home, and then where would they go if they left? 
We also talked about managing evacuations with the weather enterprise. And so part of this was how far inland did people have to evacuate? And because, of course, with this storm, a lot of inland locations never anticipated that they should have had to evacuate until it was too late. And so we talked to a lot of those folks, interviewed a lot of those folks, and they were like, you know, they were like, well, you know, we could have, but we didn't think we needed to, and we had good reason not to. We talked to one family who had a special needs child and moving his medical equipment and everything that it would take to move him overrode their decision to evacuate. And they thought, well, we won't need to anyway. Well, they got hit really hard. And this was in Mariana, Florida. And so they're like, you know, what could we have done differently? What did we need to know? And so that really got us into looking at, you know, what people know, what people understand. And part of that was the resources to evacuate. You know, what if you have a medical situation? How do you evacuate? If you don't have um, any transportation um, opportunities, how do you evacuate? What about those sheltering locations? How do you shelter along the I-10 corridor? What's the plan for that? What are the resources? And then what happens when the storm reaches those who did not think they needed to evacuate? And so now you've got this catastrophic event with people who can't get out of their homes, who are under trees, who need assistance. And so you're in a total emergency situation in a place you never thought you would have to be responding like that. So then we got into making the evacuation decision, um, and this was in collaboration with the National Weather Service. And in fact, I've um, neglected to mention uh, several of the staff at the National Weather Service office in Tallahassee were with us. And um, we went out and did these interviews and uh, took a lot of pictures and did a lot of work together. So they had a lot of questions they wanted answered. And so they wanted to know what people knew. So 43% received the extreme wind warning by WIA on their phones. 55% referenced the National Weather Service Tallahassee webpage for gathering their weather information. And 50% lost the ability to receive weather information as Michael approached and made landfall, which was a big factor because the issue was, could people get the information that was being put out? We talked to them about you know, how they got their information. Local media was the primary way, WIA, followed by WIA, then alert notifications, national media, then NOAA weather radio, and then other options. We asked them where they sought information before Michael made landfall. And you can see it was from a variety of, of sources, local TV being primary, but social media was also important, mobile apps, alert notifications, NOAA weather radio, and national TV. We asked them what would have helped them to understand the threat. The majority of respondents felt there was nothing more that could have been done. Others said more timely information. Timing is always important. Education for those without previous experience with hurricanes. And there's a lot of those folks. And then this is something that's come up in a lot of our assessment. The public wants to be told how to respond. Mandatory versus voluntary evacuations. They want to be told what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. We also focused on those that uh, endured the storm surge and their reasons for staying. And in this case, in a lot of the cases in this area, people had evacuated for Opal and couldn't get back and they decided they wouldn't do it this time. Now they will. And so that was really interesting to see that huge dichotomy in their decision-making before and after. Um, we also looked at the number of people who stayed in Mexico Beach, knowing the storm surge was coming. Uh, many people stayed in some of these high structures and kept moving to higher floors. Others stayed in one-story bungalows, which was amazing to us, and that's where a lot of the fatalities were because of the strength of the surge and the amount of water that came in the one-story bungalows. There was no way to survive in those bungalows. So trying to get at the understanding of why someone would stay in a one-story building with a surge coming in is really critical. So it really gets down to that justification psychology. Primarily, it's run from water, hide from wind. And in this case, everything that people expected didn't happen. It was far worse in regards to the storm surge. The wind was much stronger than ever experienced or anticipated, and it went much further inland. People also justified that they would be okay. Wind is not usually that big an issue. It's usually just storm surge. They didn't expect those strong winds so far inland and they didn't expect the extensive tree and structural damage. And the big takeaway is it was hard to imagine this particular outcome. 
For those who sheltered in place, they had evacuated from previous storms and not been allowed to return. Medical, employment, financial, or transportation challenges kept a lot of people in place. And then not being sure where and when they should go. That shelter information was confusing to them. Inland residents didn't think they needed to evacuate from wind. And of course, they expected that storm to change course and weaken. So I, I'll close with several quotes from people that really get at their perceptions and the, the difficulty of imagining a storm of this strength. I expected extensive damage, but wasn't prepared for what it actually turned out to be. No one expected Michael to be the monster that he was. I think that's probably one of the biggest takeaways here is how do we get people to understand this? And one of the things we recommend um, in the results of our studies is that you've got to prepare people prior to hurricane season for what has happened in previous events and people who stayed and sheltered and what happened and their experiences. You got to show them images. You got to tell them what people said so that they can understand that it could possibly possibly happen in their location in the future. Another person said, did not expect so much devastation everywhere. Again, that geographic scope of this thing was just totally unrealistic to people. Unless someone has been through a disaster of this magnitude, there is no way to prepare for a storm like this. And I think that's the biggest issue is, I think a lot of times because we've never experienced something this catastrophic, it's really hard for people to understand what to do. And I think the weather enterprise does a really good job. The emergency managers, the broadcast meteorologists, the National Weather Service personnel do a really great job of educating and outreach and training of the public and their partners about preparing for these events. And so I think it's really all about the messaging, it's getting that information out there, talking about preparedness. So for example, right now along the Gulf Coast, um, the Gulf Coast emergency management agencies are working really hard on educating the public about what an evacuation is gonna be like with COVID-19. And they're getting that information out there early. And so it's really about message dissemination and outreach and education. And you gotta keep pushing it out there. A lot of times they ask, they say, well, aren't people getting tired of all this information? Well, some people are getting tired of it. And, but it's a very small percentage of people. And even if they're tired of hearing about it and may tune it out, you may be reaching someone for the very first time, the 10th or 20th time you push that message out there. And so when we you know, reinforce that for the weather enterprise, that really you know, makes them take note of they're really doing what they're supposed to be doing and what they're doing, even with the criticisms and feedback they get, what they're doing really works. They're filling the gaps. They're getting the dissemination out there. And so a lot of this research really supports their efforts and we turn it back to them to take this information to use for future events. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Um, mm -hmm. We did get a couple of questions and one, if I can, um, I guess one of them boils down to where did you collect the data? Um, I've heard you mention at one point um, uh, someone from Mariana, which uh, isn't in a storm surge zone. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one question is sort of where was all the data collected from and were you able to do any sort of breakdown between people who were told to evacuate, who lived in areas that were told to evacuate versus those who weren't? Yeah. Um... We worked all over the area, so Panama City, Mexico Beach, south of Mexico Beach, everywhere there was a storm surge and inland damage, we went. And so we went inland to several locations, uh, several places locally there um, in East Panama City, and then down uh, the, the bay and down through uh, Mexico Beach. And so the data came from the whole region, the, the public survey came from the whole region, and we did break it down uh, according to some of those characteristics. So we uh, specifically looked in the storm surge area in terms of evacuation. We looked at the various locations, uh, coastal versus inland and evacuations, and then we broke down a lot of the other data in the same way. One of the things I didn't talk a lot about um, because we were focusing on evacuation was the power outage. 
And so the power outage was severe in all of those locations and it went down very quickly. And so being able to try to get this information out in that region was very difficult. The broadcast meteorologist went to Facebook Live and a lot of people were able to get that information that way. But then because Tallahassee had not been impacted like they thought it would be, a lot of people were getting information from friends and family in Tallahassee by text messaging. And so we were able to kind of break down those power outages and message dissemination and how people were getting information, as well as kind of a breakdown in the impacts that people were dealing with, as well as the recovery, because well inland, like in Mariana, just about every tree came down in Mariana. And uh, the Bay County Emergency Management Agency was blocked into their facility for quite a while and before they could get out. And then as they tried to get out because of all the tree damage, they couldn't do a, a proper response and get to people who needed assistance. And so a lot of our evaluation was on just the stress and anxiety um, and the PTSD that the Weather Enterprise faced because they couldn't do their jobs afterwards. So we have a lot of really good breakdown by geographic location, impacts, and conditions. Do you happen to remember off the top of your head the percentage who evacuated from the, from the storm surge evacuation zones? Uh, I believe, I don't have it in front of me, but I believe it was probably a good 60% did. Okay. That's, that's, that's not, I, I remember talking to some of the emergency management folks in Panama City after the storm, and they said that based on traffic count data, they thought that, that it was much less than that, and they were very concerned. So that would be encouraging if if uh, if it's as high as 60, although <laughs> for a storm like this, that's not great. No. <laughs> Thanks and very much. 60, you're welcome. And okay, that was 60% of our respondents too. No, I understand. Well, thanks again very much. Uh, listen, Thank there's you. one other question I want all of our panelists to, to be thinking about that's not storm specific about the work that you did, but we got a question earlier about um, uh, what you believe the uh, the effects of the pandemic and concerns about uh, COVID-19 might have on an evacuation this year. And so if we have time, I'm going to come back at the end and, and ask you everyone to to uh, share your, your feelings on that. We should be on you now, Amy. Okay, great. Um, Amy Poland is a, a graduate student. Uh, she, I think she started this work when she was uh, at the University of South Florida, but she did yep. some additional graduate work at the LSU, and now she's mm -hmm. back at USF. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Can you see my screen okay? Yep. Okay, great. So yeah, um, my name is Amy Poland. I am a master's of public health student actually now. I started off in geosciences at USF and now I'm focusing on disaster management. And today I just wanted to talk about a case study that we conducted shortly after Hurricane Irma impacted on both the geophysical and social influences that could affect a person's decision to evacuate. So just to start off, um, I'm part of the USF Weather Lab. The PI for that lab is Dr. Jennifer Collins. She's here in the lovely green. And um, prior research done as part of this lab included what is the effects of one's uh, social connections on their decision to evacuate or stay. And so that research was presented last year and we did that for both uh, Matthew and Irma pre and post storm. And any research conducted as part of this group is quite interdisciplinary. It includes a team from USF Geosciences, uh, USF's College of Public Health, uh, School of Public Affairs. And we also really try to incorporate research with undergraduate students, which includes this study. Um, and specifically with the study, we also used uh, research students in the research experience for undergraduate program on weather, climate, and society at the university, allowing them to get an experience with surveying in person, um, which sadly they can't get this summer, but at least they did during uh, the survey time. So just to start off, I wanted to give a little bit of context for Hurricane Irma. I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with it at this time, but it was part of the 2017 hurricane season. It impacted in September, uh, shortly after Hurricane Harvey affected Texas. And it made landfall as a category four storm in the Keys on September 10th. 
but all the time by September 8th, uh, many areas are already under a mandatory evacuation order. And as you can see in the graphic here, the cone of uncertainty was actually fairly large and covered the majority of the state um, due to the sheer size and magnitude of the storm in addition to Harvey, which was a storm of a similar profile impacting just months or, or a month earlier in, uh, in Texas. It kind of prompted one of the largest lot of mass evacuations ever recorded and witnessed in U.S. history. So although the storm occurred in 2017 and we have had notable storms since Irma, it's still notable to study from the perspectives of evacuation behavior as it has caused the largest observed evacuation ever recorded. And as such, um, another thing you want to consider with Hurricane Irma is the concept of social vulnerability and how social vulnerability is not evenly distributed among social groups or areas and how that's relevant for emergency management with vulnerable populations and um, planning to include everybody as part of a evacuation response. And you can define social vulnerability as the characteristics of a community that influence their ability to prepare, resist, and recover from natural hazard impacts. And as part of the study, we wanted to use the social vulnerability index, which is a popular tool that's used to identify areas of high social vulnerability risk that may need additional help during the emergency management cycle, mainly the preparation and recovery phases. So with evacuation decisions, they're dynamic and they change during the event. And they're also subject to memory decay uh, long after the event. Another factor is that most people have misconceptions about what hazards are most severe, like the example of a lot of people being concerned about wind when water is a serious hazard that they should be worried about, especially if they're in an evacuation zone. Uh, so that kind of addresses the geophysical side of our research. And then there are other factors that have been shown to influence evacuation behavior, including one's social connections or how, how many people they know, how their social networks operate, their previous evacuation experiences, and the interpretation of information and its delivery, so how users interact with information about hurricanes. The goal of this project, briefly, is just to understand the impacts of geophysical hazards such as wind and storm surge, as well as an individual social variables on how they decide to evacuate, and looking at these two in tandem instead of uh, separate, as previous research had been done. This project was conducted about nine months post Hurricane Irma. Um, we did conduct research immediately pre and post Irma, but that was a that was a different presentation. But this was done through the use of an in-person survey. And frankly, our hypothesis were focused on what influences the decision to evacuate, which includes the access to various sources of information that could influence the decision, um, the potential exposure to weather conditions. Uh, the social connections that could influence evacuation decision making and prior evacuation behavior that could influence disaster um, evacuation decision making. So our study area was uh, Pinellas County, Florida. It's the sixth most populous county in Florida. It is critically vulnerable due to its uh, peninsular geography to geophysical factors such as storm surge and vulnerable populations. So as you can see my cursor here, um, this area is Pinellas County up to here. And so uh, it's also a really popular tourist and retiree destination. Clearwater has the top rated beach in the nation. So people come here for the beaches all the time. And um, because it has so many tourists and retirees that have settled down in this area, we want to consider these hurricane vulnerable populations. It also is a very diverse area with clusters of poverty surrounded by areas of extreme affluence. And it experienced large mandatory evacuation orders during Hurricane Irma, since it is a peninsula very subject to storm surge. And so the method to choosing our specific site locations within Pinellas County involved um, identification using GIS tools. So we use the social vulnerability index provided by the CDC, as well as census data, analyzed it in GIS and looked for areas of high social and geophysical vulnerability. So areas within the evacuation zones that also happen to have a very high vulnerability score. Um, other categories considered for this um, selection included socioeconomic factors, indicators, um, housing composition, race and ethnicity, and access to transportation, which was all obtained through the census data. So the method did consist of a convenient sampling method. The locations were chosen how I just described based on the GIS analysis. The survey was distributed at three locations in public areas near shopping centers within vulnerable communities. And it was administered by teams from USF consisting of graduate and undergraduate students. And they were all trained. 
The survey was designed to take approximately 10 minutes. It was conducted paper and pen, face to face. It consisted of 23 items, which include, oh, my bad, <laughs> which included actual evacuation behavior. Um, so how the respondent obeyed or ignored the government issued evacuation for Hurricane Irma. We also asked them about how long after the order was announced what their decision that was made. And we asked them about pre previous evacuation experience, which was if they had ever evacuated between 2004 and 2016 for any previous storm before Irma. And we asked them about their future event decision making, which was would they choose to evacuate for a future major hurricane? So they're asked to select the factors that would influence their future actions to evacuate or not. Um, these include transportation, family members, uh, pets, their health, risk of damage to the home, risk of looting, finances, and, and much more. And then we also wanted to ask about the reliance on information sources, which was measured in a Likert scale, ranging from how much they relied to, with not relied on at all, to relied on the most for these information sources and how much that influenced their decision to evacuate or not during Hurricane Irma. And this included things like local television, national television, electronic, social networking, government officials, um, and their family and friends, even as their social networks. The geophysical factors included things such as storm surge and flooding. And these were also measured on a Likert scale, ranging from not influencing the decision at all to influencing the most. They were asked to rate their perceptions of these geophysical factors, as well as their level of evacuation zone they lived in, what hurricane evacuation order meant in terms of hours before impact of the storm, and if they knew the evacuation for order for Irma as mandatory or voluntary for their area. The social factors were also done on a Likert scale from strongly agree to strongly disagree. It consisted of nine questions that were found in larger instruments to assess perceptions of individual social networks. They were scored off of two measures of social connectedness is how we defined it. And that included the diversity of their networks, which is the integration essentially. So how many different roles you fill in your social network. Are you a daughter? Do you work? Um, are you an employee? Do you have parents in the area? Do you have close friends in the area? And the other measure that we used was the propensity to mobilize social resources, which is essentially a fancy way of saying how much utility is in your social networks. Would you be able to rely on others for help both monetarily, emotionally, physically during a disaster? And of course, demographics were also um, collected. So just to introduce the results, we had a sample of approximately 234 individuals. 71% uh, of them were white. Uh, the majority of them were female. We had a mean age of 45. 41% had a college degree. And 46% actually reported that their annual household income was below 40,000 a year. These respondents were then grouped into three categories. The stay at home category, which involved those who sheltered in place. The shelter category, which involves those who evacuated to a shelter outside the evacuation zone and leave so those who evacuated the area entirely like what you would picture um, people driving on the highway for hours to get out of the county and this was further refined for most of our analysis to simply those who stayed versus those who left and the, those who left included both those who left to go to a shelter and those who left and fled the area statistical analysis uh, was done using sbsf 25 and included tests such as the man whitney u spearman's row t-test anovas chi-squared and mcnamara's tests so just briefly getting into the evacuation behavior results. So for actual evacuation behavior, how they responded during Hurricane Irma, we found that 62% of respondents were in the stay-at-home category, while 27% left the area and 11 went into a shelter. For prior evacuation behavior, we found that approximately one in five respondents had previously evacuated for a storm. Of those who hadn't evacuated previously, so um, people who did not evacuate between 2004 and 2016, Two thirds of them also stayed at home for Irma. Among those who had previously evacuated at some point between 2004 and 2016, only half chose to leave while the other half stayed. But for future evacuation behavior, we got some pretty promising and you know, hopeful results that 62% so the majority of respondents indicated that they would evacuate in the future for a major hurricane. And there was a significant correlation with those who had previously evacuated during Irma and the desire to evacuate during the future, which is nice because for Pinellas, it ended up being sort of a false alarm in the fact that they didn't get any major direct effects from Hurricane Irma there. And we also asked them about the factors, why they would choose not to evacuate or evacuate for a major storm in the future. 
And those included for those who wanted to evacuate in the future, um, a concern for their safety, fear of a power outage at their residence, wind damage and flooding in that order for their top, their top reasons. And then for those who wanted to stay, their top reasons included um, their pets, a fear of looting at their household, uh, care of family members, like continual care of their, uh, their family members, and then their finances. And these factors, both for those who chose to stay as well as those who would leave, show a good mix of both the social factors and geophysical factors that would affect their evacuation behavior in the future. So the results for the sources of information, um, again, the respondents were asked on a scale from zero to four on not relied on to most relied on for their information, their dependence on sources of information to make their Irma evacuation decision. In general, respondents had the highest reliance on local media sources with a mean score of 3.36 compared to their reliance on print media with the lowest of 0 0.5, which I don't think comes as a shock to anybody anymore. Um, this analysis was done for just the stay versus leave um, categories, the one presented on the screen. And for this, we found that radio broadcasts, family far away, which was defined as over 50 miles away from you, friends nearby you, which was defined within 50 miles of you, and then social networking, which includes Facebook and Twitter, as being very vital information sources during um, making their IRMA evacuation decisions either way. And it was found that those who did evacuate had a higher reliance on these four sources than those who decided to stay. So for the geophysical factors, we asked about storm surge, strong wind, flooding, size of the storm, as well as tornadoes. And then we also asked about if social factors had an influence within this question set. And what was found was that um, all five of the geophysical factors did show up as significant for um, influencing their um, those decisions to evacuate or not. And with all of those hazards, those who left ranked each hazard as more influential than those who stayed. So with the social factors, um, scores were analyzed among two dimensions, which I vaguely talked about earlier, but essentially it was the integration of different types of relationships within one social network, which is the diversity of the roles you play. And then the propensity to mobilize or the mobilization factor for their social resources, which is how much you can utilize your social network to um, help you in a time of need. This was then broken into high and low categories, so high mobilization and integration, and low mobilization and integration based off of a calculated point threshold um, off the, uh, the indices that these were pulled from. And it was shown that those who stayed were more likely to have a low integration score, which pretty much means that um, those who stayed behind in Irma did not have as much diversity in their relationship. And it was also shown that mobilization was not shown to be significant in one's decision to evacuate or stay. We also wanted to analyze the, um, the connection between these social factors with some demographics such as education and income. And we had shown that there is a moderate positive significant relationship between integration and annual income, which suggests that those with higher income are actually likely to have more diverse relationships. And we also found a negative relationship between mobilization and highest education completed, which, um, indicated that those who had a higher connect um, higher education typically had less utility within their relationships and their network so what what does this all mean so i could i could spew out results all day but how do you actually use them um, what we found was that both geophysical and social factors affect one's decision to evacuate one of the most significant results from this study in my opinion is the comparison of past current and future evacuation behavior um, us as researchers, we had concern over those who had never previously evacuated and their decision to stay for Irma and in the future, how to uh, how to break this chain of always staying at home based off of prior evacuation experience and not changing their ways in the case of a future storm. That really could affect those people living in Pinellas County. We also really were hopeful from the results that showed that those who would evacuate in the future was 62%, that's more than half of the people um, responding. And even though this is hypothetical, um, it was really reassuring, especially because the people who we surveyed in Pinellas County who experienced the hurricane army evacuation and actually evacuated were still likely to evacuate um, in future cases, despite the false alarm narrative of Hurricane Irma in Pinellas County. 
This research, especially knowing which parts of an evacuation are most influential or scary to an individual, as well as their preferred avenues of information, such as local news stations, that can be used to inform targeted and effective risk communication in the future, especially in this 2020 season. And the need to research factors that influence evacuation decision making is vital to advancing knowledge and an understanding an individual's risk perception, uh, disaster planning and management, as well as allied fields such as public health. Uh, social work and behavioral health. Despite the limitations with the sample only being in Pinellas County, the study does show that there is a correlation and potential to motivate people to evacuate if certain factors such as family care and pets were taken into consideration. And then I wanted to quickly address our current work. So um, Dr. Collins and I have been working on a COVID-19 survey. We are collaborating with the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council and representatives in emergency management on a statewide COVID-19 sheltering and evacuation survey to prep for the 2020 hurricane season and help inform messaging from emergency management uh, groups. It is currently underway. And results are already planning, we're already planning on sharing results with the EM community, hopefully at the end of the month. And it is going through the IRB process right now, but it should be ready to go this week. I would like to say that if anyone who is viewing this presentation right now is um, interested in helping distribute the survey, it would be greatly appreciated. We want to get as representative of a sample as possible from as many different areas as possible. And so my contact information will be on the next slide if you're interested. It's a, it's a very short survey and we would love to hear back from as many people within the next month. So thank you. And then. I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Dr. Robin Erzing, Christiane Pierce, Dr. Jennifer Collins, and Michelle Saunders. And here is my email and my alternative email for uh, if you would like to reach out with any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, we, I, I, I know that uh, this is a little awkward because you said you're you're doing a study now to try to answer this question, mm -hmm. but. Um, I was going to ask all three panelists anyway. Yeah. If yeah. you have any yeah, impressions, though, about what concerns about the the pandemic might have in terms of people's uh, decision to evacuate from areas they should, mm -hmm. and two, what effect it might have on shadow evacuation. Yeah. That is whether it might actually suppress mm -hmm. something that would like to suppress anyway. Yeah. And two, and finally, uh, public shelter use whether or yeah. not it should, you think it would have an effect on those things. Mm -hmm. So if you'll start, I'm going to okay. go back and ask Laura and Mike for their opinions too. Yeah, so um, actually right now, uh, USF's College of Public Health has quite a robust program in disaster management. So I know there's a lot of groups addressing that who work closely with the Hillsborough County Emergency Management there. And right now we are all expecting a decrease in public sheltering and a theme that I keep hearing in calls and meetings about this, because this isn't the only survey I'm working on for COVID-19 right now, is that what's going to be really important in the 2020 hurricane season is trying to really clarify the difference between, you know, this whole time during sheltering in place for COVID-19, We've told people stay in their homes, don't leave. So making the transition from stay in your homes, don't leave for any reason, COVID-19 is big and scary, to please leave, there is a hurricane coming and making that transition accessible to people um, because that is quite a difference in behaviors that they should take for protective actions. And um, personally, I think probably public shelter use will decrease. I know in South Florida, they're looking into, um, they just signed a contract for, uh, using hotels as help for evacuation sheltering, which will hopefully increase people's, you know, ability to go to a shelter and feel safe. Uh, I hope we get some really good results on people's ability and want to wear masks in shelters and if they would feel comfortable going to a shelter. So I hope that answers. Good. I can't quite remember all three questions, but I hope that answers them. So, Laura, can you hear me? Yes. I, I wasn't sure how, whether I needed to change presenter, but could could you address that same issue? What uh, effect do you think the coronavirus concerns might have on evacuation and shelter use? Yeah, I think the big issue is going to be knowledge about safety when they evacuate. And um, as I mentioned in my presentation, we're already seeing the the state emergency management agencies all along the, the Gulf Coast. Um, and I imagine it's going around the coast of Florida as well, 
um, actually talking about that information, about opening these alternative locations like Amy's talking about and what's gonna be available and what the safety um, factors will be about going to those places. And I think if they get that information out there with plenty of time and they keep pushing that information out there, people are gonna feel like they have options. And I think if we acknowledge that it's a complex decision-making issue and acknowledge it now, we can help people with that decision. Because we have a lot of complex events where we have hurricanes, tornadoes, um, flooding, and so you have to take different actions with all three of those things. Well, now we're gonna add a virus to it. And so, what do you do when you have a multiplicity of events? So I think if we provide them with the calls to action for all of that and provide them good outcomes, then um, I think we'll see it. But I think it is gonna be complicated. It's gonna be very complicated. Mike, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, I, just to tell the audience, we, we, we don't have Mike on webcam, but um, Mike, would you address that same question, please? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with Amy and Laura that uh, there is a, a, a possibility of uh, uh, reduced numbers of people going to public shelters if they assume that public shelters uh, during COVID are going to be the same as public shelters have been in previous hurricanes. And that uh, explaining to people that uh, uh, circumstances will be different uh, for example, if they're going to put people up in hotel rooms and, and things like that, that, that uh, allow for more uh, distancing from other people, that that would alleviate the situation. Uh, one of the things to remember is that it's only a minority of people that do go to shelters. And, and so, uh, uh, one, of course, one of the problems with a lot of the surveys that we do is that we get an underrepresentation of people that have uh, that are um, lower income and therefore more likely to go to shelters. So we're probably in most of our our mail surveys is underestimating the percentage of the population going to shelters. But uh, I just uh, looked back at the chapter in uh, our book, um, and I will go into a little shameless self promotion here which I'm sure Jay will tolerate because he's a co-author on the book, uh, on um, uh, large-scale evacuations. Uh, uh, we did a summary of uh, the, uh, across a number of hurricanes, of, of the percentage of people who stayed with peers, who went to commercial facilities, and who stayed in public shelters. And the average is 62% of households uh, go to stay uh, with peers and an average of about 27% stay in commercial facilities. So assuming, uh, as I think is fairly likely, that peers are going to be reasonably receptive, there's not going to be much attrition there, that uh, uh, most of the people who would go to stay with peers will have some peers that will take them in. Most of the people that will go to commercial facilities probably will go there, and so for that's roughly 90% of, of the population, probably a little bit less uh, uh, because we've, those numbers are biased by, uh, by uh, toward higher income uh, populations, that uh, you know, somewhere between 80 to 90% of the people are probably gonna be minimally affected by uh, the, the COVID threat. And that it's going to be the shelter population uh, the people that need to go to shelters uh, that uh, are going to be mainly lower income people. And uh, so making sure that uh, they uh, are aware that there are different arrangements uh, is going to be important. As it turns out, uh, there's a, a flood evacuation uh, that uh, recently took place in Michigan. And so they ran across that problem there. My understanding was that in the public shelters, uh, what they were going to do was to space the beds farther apart, which meant that there would be decreased density in uh, the, uh, the shelters that were closest to the impact area. Uh, in turn, that means that they have to uh, activate shelters that are farther away. 
So that is a feasible alternative for jurisdictions, especially jurisdictions, since most jurisdictions have uh, lost an enormous amount of money in tax revenue. And so they're going to be facing straightened uh, financial circumstances for trying to deal with the situation. On the other hand, the hotels uh, are not having many people, and so they may be willing to cooperate at reduced or no cost. So it's uh, uh, it's going to require some, some planning, but it, I think it's important to recognize uh, that even though it's a problem, it's not a uh, it's not likely to be a catastrophic problem. It's, it's a manageable problem uh, if the local jurisdictions can uh, 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 recognize the scope of the problem and to deal with uh, the uh, commercial facilities in uh, uh, near the evacuation zones and then also in counties farther uh, away. Thank you, Mike. Um, Amy, we got a question asking if you could just give some idea of the sorts of questions that you're asking in your COVID-19 survey yeah. now. Yeah, actually, I can open it up right now just so I can make sure that I that I inform <laughs> you correctly. <laughs> so um, right now, it's a pretty short survey. It should take approximately five minutes to complete. We're going to have, it's going to be offered through Qualtrics, and um, we're going to have a distribution link for both Spanish and English surveys. And it'll include your basic demographics questions. Um, we also have questions about evacuation zones, the type of structure that they live in, if they rent or own their homes. And then we have questions in for the COVID-19 section specifically about if they consider themselves vulnerable to COVID-19 risks, um, if they have any of the predisposition health conditions, we have a whole list that they can select from. As well, we are asking about transportation, um, if they consider themselves in need of a special needs shelter and if they have registered for a shelter, um, special needs shelter. And then a series of questions asking if they agree or disagree with, you know, prior to COVID-19, I would have gone to a shelter. I am willing to wear a mask in a shelter. Um, I will still go to a shelter if I need to during 2020. Um, where I would evacuate either inside or outside of my county so you can see where people are moving within Florida and um, like if people's option is only to shelter within the county as well as um, yeah and then and then demographic questions so it's about it's in total about 30 questions good deal thank you mm -hmm. yeah. um, Laura we had a, another question for you about given <laughs> given the impact and the damage that was caused by Michael by wind um, do you think that Emergency managers managers should rethink the the old adage um, run from the water, hide from the wind in terms of who they advise to evacuate. Yeah, um, and I think they came to terms with that themselves in this particular event as it evolved. Um, it was really interesting talking to them, um, mm -hmm. you know, how they dealt with their evacuation zones and how they started trying to warn people um, in particular locations once they understood the wind speed and that it was going to start to impact locations that had not experienced such extensive wind before. And I think the short duration problem was uh, the big issue for everybody. If they'd had more time, of course, it would have been a little bit easier to do. And I think that's really um, what the, the biggest you know, lessons learned are from the Hurricane Michael study is understanding that in an event like this, you're going to kind of have to change your messaging and change people's perceptions very quickly and remind them that these sort of things can happen. And that's what that weather enterprise had already done by the time that we had talked to them. I mean, they're the experts on it now. And so the, the big thing is to you know turn that information back to other emergency managers in hurricane prone locations to understand that that's a phenomenon to, to be overcome. And you know use the data from a study like this to actually guide what you do. Well, listen, I'd like to thank all three of our presenters and um, just to remind the audience that uh, the presentations were being recorded. And I don't know exactly how we access them, but we can go back and and uh, if you if there were any slides that you really wanted people to, to if you'd like to have a second look at because you didn't get the numbers from or or something like that, then uh, we can do that. So thanks everyone again, and thanks the audience for listening. Bye.